is if you still have your badge on before uh, any photography is taken. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats. The ceremony will begin momentarily. We ask that you please silence all electronic devices until after the ceremony and remove all badges. Throughout the ceremony, you will be given cues to stand and be seated. As a reminder, during the national anthem, military members should stand at attention and our civilian guests should place their right hand over their heart. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Senior Master Sergeant Xavier Thompson, and I will be your narrator for today's ceremony. I am pleased to welcome you to our ceremony honoring Chief Master Sergeant Joseph Ippolito as he retires from the Air Force with 25 years of dedicated service to his country. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of the national anthem by Chief Master Sergeant Allison Garces. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight of the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave. For the land and of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you, Chief Master Sergeant Garces. Master Sergeant Retired James Constance, please come forward to deliver our invocation. Please bow your heads. Lord, today we ask you to look down upon Joseph Ippolito and help him in this time of transition so he could be successful in his next life. Please watch over his family as they continue to move on to their future roles as they are no longer part of our Air Force family. But you, Joe, always will be. We ask you in your name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you, Chief Master Sergeant Garces and Master Sergeant Retired James Constance, who had no idea that he was going to be doing that this afternoon. So thank you so much. That was, that, that was beautiful. At this time, I would like to welcome our official party for this afternoon's ceremony. Please hold your applause until the end of the introductions. Our presiding officials, the commander, Joint Staff Support Center, Defense Information Systems Agency, Colonel Angela Freeman, and the Cyber Capabilities and Policy Branch Chief at the Joint Staff J6, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel J. Kim. Our honoree, Chief Mass Sergeant Joseph Ippolito, accompanied by his spouse Alexis and their children Leah, Thomas, and Alora. His mother, Lindy Blowers. His father, Carmen Ippolito III. His mother-in-law, Bonnie Schuler. His father-in-law, Chief Petty Officer Retired Gare Schuler his brother-in-law, Brad Schuler, and spouse, Audrey Schuler, and their children, Madeline, Michael, and Nora, his sister-in-law, Alicia Wagler, and her husband, Daniel Wagler. Unable to attend, but exceptionally important to Chief Ippolito, are his sisters, Katie Stone, and brother, Matthew Hopped. Also joining us today, the Director of Cyberspace Operations and Warfighter Communications, Brig Brigadier General Select Joy M. Kazor, 406 Air Expeditionary Wing Command, Command Chief, Chief Master Sergeant Ted Braxton, 
the incoming 1B4 career field manager, Chief Mass Sergeant Michelle Lorden, recruiting career field manager, Chief Mass Sergeant Brett Hamilton, avionics career field manager, Chief Mass Sergeant Joss Hobbelt, aviation resource management career field manager, Chief Mass Sergeant Sean Jones, Cyberspace Force Career Field Manager, Senior Mass Sergeant Stephen Shockey. We would also like to extend a very warm welcome to all group commanders, squadron commanders, chiefs, co-workers, family and friends who are here in attendance or joining us virtually to share in this special occasion today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, while it's not common practice to have two presiding officials, Chief Master Sergeant Ippolito had to be different as usual. <laughs> it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the presiding officials for today's ceremony, Colonel Freeman and Lieutenant Colonel Kim. Colonel, Kim, Colonel Freeman will offer her remarks first, followed by Colonel Kim. Colonel Freeman, ma'am, the floor is yours. I agree. Quiet in front. Yeah, so we just decided that we're married now. Our name is Colonel Krim, if anybody is wondering. Thanks. <laughs> hey, so good afternoon. What a, what a great day to be in the Pentagon today, and especially in this facility um, where we honor our Medal of Honor recipients. I want to welcome our distinguished military guest, uh, General Kazor, General Select Kazor. Can you just get promoted already? <laughs> Not ready yet. Um, Chief Braxton, Chief Lorden, Chief Hamilton, Chief Heibold, Chief Jones, Senior Master Sergeant Shockey, fellow airmen, veterans, and families of our military members, and then my lovely husband, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Douglas Freeman. Um, next, I want to do a special welcome to the family that are here today. Uh, we always love when our biological family comes together with our Air Force family to celebrate these events, and especially as we return him to you um, after his 24-ish, 25, I can't count and two days, two days. Um, with the Air Force. Those two days are very important. So mom and dad, in-laws, brothers-in-laws, babies, uh, nieces, nephews, those watching uh, here and afar, welcome. Uh, I do want to spend a, a, just a quick moment to, to thank the, the four in the front row right here. So Alexis, um, I asked Joe to fill out this sheet and tell me a little bit about the family and where they're going. So he did for the kids, he completely left you off. <laughs> Just so you know, there was no information. Did you realize you did that? He wrote everything for me anyway. Oh. This is gonna go swimmingly well with the rest of this speech. Um, so Alexis is also a veteran, so I wanna thank you for your service. I'm sorry you had to be in the first combat comm squadron, but that's how it goes. Um, but uh, Alexis and kids, I wanna thank you for your many years of support, not only to your husband, to your father, but also to our nation. I'm also a military spouse. I'm also a mom of military kids, and I know it's not easy. And you've had multiple deployments, a one-year remote, um, and those are definitely not easy on the family. So I don't know much about Alexis other than what I knew when you know, I watch her on Facebook. And I got an out-of-office attendant from her when I emailed her. So she is a security manager and assistant facility security officer with the Intelligence and Security Academy. So it's pretty impressive. Is she going to bring home the bacon now and you're going to sure. take some time? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> so Leia 17, she's going to be a senior this year. Um, her and my, my older daughter are the same age. They actually hung out together in, in, at Capon Air Station. You had no idea. Thomas, you hung out with my younger daughter. Had no idea. You don't remember. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, but Leia is described as independent and fierce. She likes crocheting and jewelry making. And her career aspirations are to pursue biomechanical engineering to make prosthetics, which I think is amazing tie back to her upbringing and giving back to definitely our uh, service members. Thomas is the middle child, 15. Do you have your learner's permit yet? I 
Uh, <laughs> Leia, do you have your drivers? No. Nope. Yeah. It's a good call. <laughs> Mine too. Um, Dad describes Thomas as easygoing and funny. He's not sure what he wants to do when he grows up. Not quite yet. He likes video games, computers, and working on cars. So there's actually a lot of applicable jobs combining all of those now. Um, and maybe you could join your sister in developing something that's of military use and get us some more remotely piloted something or other. Alora's 12 and in the seventh grade, she enjoys drawing and making movies and wants to pursue a career in psychology. Um, and then the next thing that they told me actually kind of builds all that in together, which I think would be a really great psychological film. Um, Dad describes her as a natural leader, and she was known in school as the Rat King. <laughs> and uh, kids would bring her their snacks so that they could join her rat army. So I kind of see a mean girl, psychedelic type of movie there. But Alexis, Leia, Thomas, and Alora, your, your husband and your dad are extremely proud of you. Um, you, are the, you are the reason that he is what he is today and that he was successful throughout his career. It was your love, support, and gentle nudging that you all gave him. Um, yeah, we say gentle. Um, there were times when he wanted to separate, as you know, Alexis, and you were there to push him and make sure that he stayed on track um, and became the chief that we know today. Didn't think that was going to happen, but it did. OK. <laughs> I saw his records, y'all. <laughs> OK, because we're mixing things up a little bit today, I thought we'd have some fun, um, because I think that's what you want with this ceremony. So um, have you guys ever seen these day-by-day -day calendars? So I have factor crap. So we're going to start practice on a real factor crap from my desk. It's today's. Since 1962, the official sport of Maryland has been jousting. Fact or crap? Fact. 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 Maryland was the first state to adopt an official sport. Apparently, the sport lasts until nightfall. OK. So we're going to play this game throughout, throughout my, my portion of the speech. I don't know if you have fact or craps, but that's OK. <laughs> he did, but he stole it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> So to start, let's talk about a little bit about Joe and his early life. Um, he's from Kenosha, Wisconsin. I think you have one of those cheesehead obnoxious things. OK. OK, good. Um, he graduated from George Nelson Trimper High School in 1998. I tried to find something about his high school. I didn't find anything good about his high school. There's actually some stuff that's not so great lately. Um, so nothing's changed. So nothing's changed. Yeah. I tried to find a photo. I couldn't find a photo. Um, so I had to go off of what he told me. Um, during high school, he enjoyed studying foreign languages and was active in the Civil Air Patrol. And he earned the Billy Mitchell Award. Uh, this award is a given to cadets that show excellence in leadership, aerospace, fitness, and character. And like most kids from the Midwest, I'm an Illinois gal. His travels during ch childhood included the bordering states of Illinois and once into Indiana when he made a wrong turn. <laughs> Throughout and after high school, he worked multiple jobs. And so I want you all to picture him in these jobs. McDonald's. That was awesome, McDonald's. A big and tall store. Um, <laughs> before I was. <laughs> Aspirations. <laughs> I can't come tonight, by the way, so I'm sorry. i got to keep it clean, though. My, that's my team back there videotaping. And, um, a VHS video processing factory, a steel mill, pe various pizza places, installing insulation, and a telemarketer. <laughs> my favorite. OK, so we're going to do the first factor crap based off of uh, Joe's life. So in high school, Joe borrowed the family vehicle. He bumped into another vehicle, causing a small scratch. He then proceeded to run away from the accident and used a Sharpie to cover the scratch from his parents. <laughs> parents? <laughs> You want me to give an answer? Yeah, fact or crap? That's crap. 
Yep. <laughs> Completely made up. Okay. So that's how we play the game. It, I know, right? But I did get a ticket on the first day I got my license. Well, there you go. First hour. First hour. All right. So back to the story. So Joe's goal was to go to college, but he didn't want to take out student loans. So like many of us, he joined the Air Force to pay for school, which also gave, gave him an escape from his hometown, which is also like most of us. Um, and with that resume, he was a shoe-in for the communications and cyber career fields. In December 1999, he came on active duty starting as an E3 because of that Billy Mitchell Award. He got to bump up uh, in rank. He became a satellite communications technician. His first base was Shaw Air Force Base, South Carolina. We did take photos earlier while we were waiting of folks from all your bases. Um, yeah, there weren't many early, but later. Um, an airman's first evaluation is always interesting and often gives you some insight into the strengths of our newest warfighters. Joe completed his first three volumes of his career field training with a 93.5% test average and was part of the base honor guard, so that was good. He did a lot of maintenance, repair, and setup of satellite equipment and participated in exercises. His supervisor called him an above average achiever and technically capable, and he contributed positively to the work center mission. His second rating period in the Air Force started one day after 9-11. And when I do these ceremonies, I like to look back at those who have, were in the service on 9-11 um, to see where folks were on that day and what they provided to the War on Terror shortly after. And Joe was at Shaw Air Force Base, which is the headquarters for Air Force Central Command, where that war was ran out of. So he was in the thick of Operation Enduring Freedom and the response from an angry nation. He was still very young, but he was ensuring equipment and operators were ready for deployment and welcomed back some of our first deployers and took their equipment and ensured they were ready to return to the war. During his time at Shaw, he was part of the Base Honor Guard to include rendering colors for the annual base POW MIA observance ceremony, which is, a, I think, a cause dear to your heart. Uh, for his second evaluation, he was deemed a hard worker with boundless, untapped potential and a strong contributor if your phone goes off, you have to get up and dance to the ringtone. Um, and a strong contributor, and with continued vigilance, he will be an outstanding performer. Joe still was not performing at his full capacity. What was holding you back? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> Okay, in 2003, he got an opportunity to see war up close in front, and he deployed to Bagram Air Base, Afghanistan, where he served as a supervisor and also the unit's ammunition custodian for 26 personnel and 7,710 rounds of army provided small arms ammo. Did you volunteer for that duty? Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, he was directly supporting TACPs and close air support for the 82nd Airborne Corps um, during those early stages of OIF where it was very violent. He, forward deployed, he deployed forward with DOD contractors to some forward operating locations to set up joint radio relay systems. Something clicked, and senior airman Ippolito finally got a five evaluation. So five is the top evaluation you could get. So I was very proud of you. You finally got to that high ranking. It wasn't a firewall, but you got to that five. <laughs> and he got a push that he was a solid technician ready to accept increased responsibilities, challenge and promote ahead of his peers. So you guys ready for another factor crap? Yes. Okay. While in Bagram, senior airman Ippolito devised a plan to transfer communications to the Army. After his senior master sergeant told him to table the idea, he seized the opportunity to brief his commander behind his senior master sergeant's back, got it approved, and Joe and 20 fellow airmen got to redeploy three weeks later. True. <laughs> All right, next Joe made a mistake and got assigned to Ramstein Air Base to the first combat communication squadron. <laughs> he did a lot of great things during this tour, including taking a more active role in training, education, processing, improvement, and standardization. The first combat communication squadron deploys all throughout um, Africa and USAFE to support uh, operations. While he was there, he completed his Community College of the Air Force degree. He completed Airman Leadership School, and he won multiple 
uh, U.S. Air Forces in Europe Communications and Information Awards to include and the 2005 Air Force Maintenance Effective Effectiveness Award. He continued to pursue his bachelor's degree, maintaining a perfect 4.0 GPA. His last year of the assignment at First Combat Com, he was selected as a quality assurance evaluator where he was able to sharpen his skills as, as a newly promoted staff sergeant. Through this critical assignment, he applied knowledge from his two combat deployments and his first tour at Shaw Air Force Base. While at Ramstein, he also continued to volunteer and get back to the Air Force and the community with things like volunteering for the Special Olympics, supporting the Booster Club, doing a stint as a recruiter's assistant, which was also a way to get back home, yeah? Yeah. And he was his flight's Air Force assistance rep. Uh, he note, also of note, he performed for 400 personnel in USAFE's Project Cheer Battle of the Bands concert. The whole band's here. Is the whole band here? <laughs> Is it two? No. Oh, okay. Only Sorry. <laughs> the other guy is on his way to get a flat tire. But okay. Crap. <laughs> no, that's fact. <laughs> that's fact. Um, during his time at First Combat Com, he deployed to Al Dafra Air Base, uh, UAE, in support of OIF. While there, he cre while there, he created a database that tracked scheduled maintenance for 134 communications assets, and he developed and taught a maintenance data collection course to 15 deployed personnel. He was also the Xbox modder. <laughs> so people all over base would bring him their Xboxes for upgrades. That is super nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, most notably during this tour at Ramstein um, is he met Alexis. So Alexis was in processing Joe with the first combat comm squadron. Joe was immediately smitten, trying to act all cool and super smooth. <laughs> Alexis, maybe not so much. Um, after Joe dropped an F-bomb, she agreed to go on a date with him. Which brings us to our next factor crap. On their first date, an ambitious Joe leaned in and gave Alexis a kiss. Alexis did not return said kiss, and that ended their first date. That's uh, a tricky question. It's partially true. So while that did indeed happen, he leaned in and tried to give Alexis a kiss. She did not return said kiss. He tried again. <laughs> Rejected twice. <laughs> so, f fact and crept. Leia's given mom a high five. <laughs> so, from Ramstein, he moved to Beale Air Force Base, California to support the Global Hawk as a SATCOM technician. This was only a few years after the Global Hawk were put into combat use. They provided real time intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance to the warfighter and many three-letter intelligence agencies supporting Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation uh, Iraqi Freedom. He ensured the system was operational and able to communicate, ensuring hundreds of combat sorties and thousands of intelligence images that enabled combat operation and protection of our fo frontline forces. He continued making things better than he found them, preparing training for inspections and training his coworkers, creating databases and improving processes. He gave back to the local Civil Air Patrol by talking to their cadets and sharing his experience. He supported multiple fundraisers for base events and was a church leader for the base chapel. He marched in the local community Veterans Day parade, and he bridged a gap in manning at the airman's attic to ensure that critical capability was available. He continued working on his bachelor's degree and maintained that 4.0 GPA. During that tour at Beale, he also deployed to Al Dafra, also supporting the Global Hawk. He demonstrated his technical skills during his time at Aldafra, and he much preferred being in Aldafra than at Beale. Uh, he was active in the deployed community both with the chapel and also by displaying his vocal songwriting skills again at a two-day event where he was recognized with a cash award. So it was during this tour at Beale that Leah and Thomas joined the family, giving Joe new purpose. Something rare for military families is that uh, Leah and Thomas were both born in the same hospital room at Roseville, California. So for our next factor crap, Joe finally overcame his early stumble on evaluations and was picked up for tech sergeant coming out of Beale with a firewall five. 
received a four EPR, so one down from the best, on his last eval before he was selected for staff sergeant. Definitely not you, what you would expect to see in a future chief's uh, records. After Bill, Joe then went to the best squadron in the United States Air Force, the first communications maintenance squadron at Capon Air Station, Germany. The first comm maintenance squadron is a hand-selected unit performing engineering and installation for USAFE, AF Africa, and NATO. Joe was an infrastructure special communications team member, which required him to expand his level of expertise. Shortly after arriving, he deployed to Camp Asalea, Asalea Cutter as a network system administrator supporting the Joint Psychological Operations Task Force and co-leading the Army J6 Computer Support Center. He did a lot of really cool stuff, supporting military information support team, much of which we cannot talk about in this forum. While there, he led a fitness challenge. His team ran 157 miles over three week weeks and earned first place out of 45 teams that entered that competition. Was just you? Yeah. You ran 157 miles <laughs> in three weeks? I have the trophy. I have it as crap also. Crap. But Capon is where I first met Joe. Um, I arrived at Capon to the first communications maintenance squadron in the summer of 2011 for my first squadron command. Joe was one of the first individuals in my office. They don't really prepare you for your first squadron command, but you're extremely nervous, and you know that those first interactions with your troops, your airmen, is extremely critical because that's what gets back to the rest of the unit. But Joe walked in my office, I can't remember the whole interaction, so I may ask for your help. But he came into my office, I know you do, visibly concerned with a folder of information that was in the desk left by the previous commander. You had filed an IG complaint? I was going to. Oh, he was going to file an IG complaint and said, said information was in the desk of the commander's drawer. And Joe was concerned that I would read that file and then have an impression of him that would last throughout my command. And I'm not sure what I told you, but it was essentially, didn't read it, doesn't matter, that's history. Yeah, I think said clean slate. Or clean slate, press on, move forward. And I think that's just what he needed. Um, now I've screwed up, I don't know where I am. He shifted into high gear, and with Alexis giving him a swift kick in the booty every day, and the first comm maintenance team pushing him to work and holding him to the standard of the first communication maintenance squadron, he didn't look back. What Joe didn't know is that my predecessor shredded almost everything in the office uh, before he left, except Joe's file and a couple other things. So it was there. I kept it just in case I needed it. <laughs> I'm just happy um, I had free rent in that guy's head. <laughs> but I don't think I ever read the file. Yeah. I think it got shredded. Um, at first comm maintenance, Joe was critical to multiple infrastructure projects to include the Ankara Office of Defense Cooperation Military Networks and Ankara Air Base Tech Control Facility and voiceover IP upgrades. Interlook Air Bases, network upgrades, Guylan Kirk Kirkens Air Base network overhaul, a voiceover IP training lab, Warrior Prep Center network cabling and everything over IP network, Logis Air Base emergency cipranet restoral, a secure voice res resolution, a data wall merger between UCOM and AFRICOM, and restoral of Spang Spangdalem's identify friend or foe transmit capabilities. He was also critical to NATO's Operation Unified Protector and the US Operation Odyssey Dawn for Libya operations in 2011. He assured command and control by planning, engineering, and installing infrastructure to support operations and bases supporting those two ops. He worked with First Combat Comm Squadron, and orchestrated a tactical to fix transfer of communications, so first comm maintenance was last out. Leading fellow special comm team members to establish C2 for two air expeditionary wings, two combat air operations, over 26,000 flights, enforcement of a no-fly zone over Libya, and el elimination of Gaddafi after he led an attack on his own civilians that were protesting his rule. First Comm Maintenance received multiple awards, and Joe was the 435th Air and Ground Operation Wings 2011 3D Outstanding NCO of the Year. 
So sorry I had to talk a lot about first come maintenance because you know it's the best. Um, however, for the second time, Joe received markdowns on his annual evaluation and an overall four EPR that year. Uh, the year before being selected for promotion. Yes. Um, but he got a four on his evaluation and then got promoted to master sergeant. So I, I was thinking this was a trend, but it actually had stopped there. Yeah. So he continued his pursuit of that master's degree or bachelor's degree, maintaining a perfect 4.0 and being inducted into the National Honor Society. He supported the Basin Unit to include Booster Club, VP, Vice President, Combined Federal Campaign, working a barbecue for a 10-day NATO exercise, saving the life of a choking child, and coordinating a blood drive. He also graduated NCO Academy, receiving the Academic Award and Distinguished Graduate as the number one of his class of 150, which is pretty significant. But the most significant thing that was on cue that happened during that tour at Capon is that Alora was born. <laughs> She joined the Dragon family and completed Team Ippolito. So before we move on to the next assignment in Korea, let's do another factor crap. During Joe's deployment in Qatar, he discovered the game of cornhole and has aspirations on going pro one day. From Ramstein, from Ramstein, Master Sergeant Ippolito took a one-year unaccompanied tour to Osan Air Base Korea, where he was the section chief for plans and implementation. He led seven personnel managing 37 communications projects valued at over $19.8 million that enabled the 7th Air Force and the 51st Fighter Wing defense missions over the Republic of Korea. He led projects to upgrade the base's air traffic control systems, missile warning systems, cleanup of comm closets, and revamp the flight line tech order systems. He continued pursuing that elusive bachelor's degree, maintaining his 4.0 GPA, and this time earned his CCNA commercial cyber certification. He did this while also finding time to be the vice president of the 51st Comm Squadron's top three. His time in Korea was short, but deserving of a factor crap. Factor crap. While on a tour of the Korea demilitarized zone, Joe accidentally crossed the border between North and South Korea, and a North Korean guard pulled his weapon on Master Sergeant Ippolito. Totally made up. So from Korea, Joe met back up with his family at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, which I will now call Hickam, where he was assigned to the Headquarters Pacific Air Force's Directorate of Communications as the NCIC of the Cyber Fusion Center. I'll touch on a few highlights of his first couple years of Hickam before turning it over to Lieutenant Colonel Kim, because he crossed trains, and then my job is done. Um, Joe continued to do great things at Hickam, averting a Wake Island network isolation, directing the Operation Deep Freeze Communications Security Program to deliver Antarctic Joint Task Force Command and Control, provided support to the Joint Forces Air and Space Component Commander, guided an Air and Space Operations Center uh, secret network migration, managed airfield landing system outages and repairs, supported typhoon evacuation operations, drafted cyber reporting guidelines, piloted a Kadena Air Base secure voice repair, executed four critical Air Force cyber ops, oversaw Operation Noble Eagle radar feed maintenance to restore the Hawaiian air picture and restored Guam's combat search and rescue command and control link that led to recovery of a missing airman's remains. He won multiple awards and mentored many of his peers and subordinates to major award wins. He continued to be active in the Air Force and local community. He chaired the Wings Combat Dining Inn, completed the first sergeant's course, led a dorm painting project, and honchoed the com Commander Pacific Air Force's Mahalo Bash for 850 attendees. He finally finished that, that bachelor's degree in computer and information science in information science, graduating summa cum laude with a 4.0 GPA. Now our last factor crap for the day, unless you're taking over. Um, Joe was motivated by people telling him he could not do something, which led him to honcho an event that honored our POW MIAs during POW MIA week. 
During this event, he led a team that read over 83,000 names of POW MIAs from World War II to present. <laughs> Fact. This, is now a, this event is now an annual tradition at uh, Hickam. So before I hand the mic over, I want to read one of Joe's favorite quotes, which is part of a speech given by Teddy Roosevelt. It's about facing challenges head on, displaying courage to say and do what needs to be said and done when it's tough to do so. This epitomizes Joe's career. The Man in the Arena by Teddy Roosevelt. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause? who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while, dar while daring greatly, so that his place so shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So Joe, I wanna thank you and team at Belito for allowing me to be part of this ceremony today, honoring your career and uh, and leaving, and thank you for leaving the Air Force better than you found it. So with that, I now turn it over to Colonel Kim to finish up his career. So this is a pretty cool opportunity for me. So I, I wanna say thank you, Joe, uh, for the opportunity. This is a little clunky, so I'll say forgive us for like two different presiding officials. Um, Joe, this is a pretty cool opportunity because as part of my triad, my first ever triad, we have Chris Beck back there. He was my first sergeant. I got to retire him about a year and a half ago, and now I get to retire my chief, right? <clears throat> it's bittersweet in a sense that. Um, Are you going to cry? <laughs> I'm trying to get your, your, your wife to cry, so if you'll, <laughs> if you'll take it easy while I choke up and, you know, all right. So um, the story of Joe is pretty interesting in a, in a different way. I could regale you with a bunch of cyber nerd numbers, but here's the thing, nobody cares, right? <laughs> what we care about is the people that Joe touched and the people that Joe uplifted in the time that he was a 24 or a 3 Delta. It, it doesn't matter, right? And so the story of Joe then, right, is at the 56 ACOMs, his commander, because I always love reading like what the commander says about somebody in, in the kind of the bottom line, right? His commander was like, Joe is a gifted mentor who draws followers. That's the line, right? And what's awesome about that line is if you look at Joe's career writ large, right, you'll see that he focuses on exercises and making them good and relevant. He focuses deeply on training, which is really important to him. And then he focuses on mentorship and figuring out who else is coming up behind him, right? So the cool part of that is all of that, all of that is about people, right? It's all about people, whether or not they'll touch him or not, whether or not he'll meet them or not, whether or not you know, they can get something from him or not, it doesn't matter. That's what Joe does, and that's how he supports them, right? So from the 56 ACOMs at Hawaii, he, he turns into a one Bravo. I saw some of the bullets in there. There were a lot of like IT bullets, and I'm like, are you really a Roman? You know, whatever. I guess, I guess it's all like, sure. It was an MDT. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so from the 56 ACOMs, he goes to the favorite city of Alexis Ippolito, San Antonio. She loves it. Which is why she got to spend six whole years there. Right? Um, but you'll find that Joe got to go to the 24th Air Force staff as a master sergeant. What's interesting about that is, once again, as an additional duty, he picked up 24th Air Force staff, UTM, which is a unit training manager. Again, kind of a passion area for him. He focused on making sure people got relevant training, and he also developed lines of effort in standing up. What, what does it mean to even be a one Bravo four, a cyber warfare operator? A lot of people have opinions. A lot of them are irrelevant. But it really comes down to, how are you pushing this ball forward, right? And at least, at least, Joe is throwing out ideas in hopes that some of that will stick. 
And it doesn't matter if you're wrong, right? At least have an opinion. Because then it's easy to criticize somebody without an idea or thoughts because they just sit there in the peanut gallery and throw criticism, right? Hence the Teddy Roosevelt quote. But it's different to stand on something, to stand for something, which is what Joe does time to right? What I found is, once again, a push from the 24th Air Force commander, two-star general, was like, this is my number one of 58 master sergeants. Promote him the hell now, right? And from there he makes senior master sergeant, right? So he spends kind of two years on staff, doing a ton of different things, and staff, ladies and gentlemen, as you're well aware, if you've been there, is painful, right? <laughs> Doesn't matter, pushing the ball forward, right? From there, he goes to the 33rd Network Warfare Squad, which is the best squad in the world. You may, have heard, you may have heard earlier some misinformation about the first squad maintenance squadron, right? But you know, if you have to put first in the name, are you really first? Right? <laughs> So, he's at the 33rd Network Warfare Squadron, and once again, you know, the talking points are similar. He comes in, he's focused on revamping training, he's more focused on working with Headquarters Air Combat Command to establish a simulator for defensive cyber operations, kind of the first of its kind that we're trying to do, yeah. right? And he's focused on working with vendors to provide more relevant training, right? Because Air Force training can be painful at times. Right? And sometimes vendors and industry do an excellent job at it. Right? So he's figuring out how can I make this work. And he's doing all of that as the ops superintendent. Right? So kind of spends two years at the 33rd, right? has an interesting time there, I know. Right? And from there, he moves on to the 836, from 20 to 21. Right? And at the 836, the 67th Cyber Wing Commander was Bottom line, Joe is awesome, right? That was the bottom line quote in his email. And just, again, this is who Joe is. I was right? just surprised I got that through. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe an exec should have caught that, but that's okay, right? Uh, yeah. You hear that Joe is awesome, but once again, he goes to the CVH, which is a maneuver, folks who deploy out a weapon system, and you know he gets distinguished graduate out of the initial qualification training out there. And that's that's normal, right? You hear time and again of his performance in training, his performance writ large in schooling, always 4.0, always at the top of his game, right? And so from the 836, where he was focusing on things like preventing foreign election interference, right? He comes back to the 33rd, and this is when I meet him in the summer of 21. And as part of the quote, right, as part of what Joe wants to be known for is speaking truth to power, right? My intro to Joe was, hey, sir, I'm coming back to the 33rd, but to be honest, I really don't want to be here. And I was like, awesome, right? That's, that's exactly what I want to hear from my senior enlisted leader. I don't want to be here. Woo, command is awesome. This is great. And then, <laughs> In addition to that, of course, Chris Beck is my first sergeant, and he's like, hey, sir, I need to take leave, and I'm going out for two weeks. <laughs> so I'm like, even better. <laughs> um, but I'll say that that is Joe, right? That is characteristic Joe, right? Which is ultimately, he's not, he doesn't care whether you like him just because he says the things that you want to hear. He doesn't care that you, you're, you're wanting to hear something from him that for some kind of advocacy. He's going to just shoot it to you straight. And the straight of it was that he had a rough time in his first go. And because of that rough time, he was concerned about coming back. And perhaps similar to Colonel Freeman's story is, I, told, I don't care about your past. right? Show me you can be an SCL at the 33rd. That's all I care about. right? Take care of our people, which according to your record, it says you do. So what's the problem? right? And man, you know, Joe knocked it out of the park, right? I'll tell you, I only got seven months with him. So that was a little bit of like a challenge because he was like, hey, sir, they're looking to do chief assignments right now, and there's a chance I can get mine up. And I was like, oh, man, so I got to help you not get mine up. Um, <laughs> but as part of that, too, which is, by the way, in North Dakota, it's nothing. 
And then as part of that too, he's like, also Alexis is done with San Antonio, so I need to find somewhere quick, right? From the 33rd then, the largest cyber operations squad in the Air Force, where we have the most one Bravos, um, he gets plucked and he becomes the career field manager for the entire one Bravo four career field. And you'll see once again, his entire career is leading to that moment of mentorship, exercises, right, and just training and develop, right? And once he gets to the Pentagon, we're talking almost every day because I'm like, hey, I still miss you. And he's like, well, I'm really busy. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but, but really, it's, hey, you're the one Bravo functional, like, send me some pieces, please. Send me some uh, operators. But it, in all actuality, he's got to turn around perhaps our biggest issue, which is kind of retention of our incredibly talented one Bravo four operators. Huge challenge. You're competing against industry. You're competing against people who don't want, don't let you, you know, you don't have to take a PT test in industry, right? And that can be pretty amazing. Um, so you're competing against culture, and then money is last, right? So how do you fight that? How do you fight culture? How do you fight money? How do you fight agency, right? And when going from military or government civilian over to industry, right? So huge Herculean task that he's got to battle. Our recruiting and retention rate, our retention rate at the time was in like the 40s for a lot of our one problem forms, which is terrible because in many ways, we're developing all these cyber operators, trained, lethal, and incredible people, but then they're all going to industry over X amount of time. And inherently, that's not a bad thing because, yeah, hey, go, go to the US, do great things, let's go, right? Lift all, lift all boats. But the issue with that, perhaps, is we still need great operators in the Air Force, right? And so his task was to then stem the, stem the tide and figure out how to make it better, right? And so what you'll find is if you read through the history, um, he did simple stuff in terms of he opened up a pipeline so brand new people to the Air Force can now become one Bravos. It used to be retrain only. So you had to have somebody who was already in the Air Force for X number of years, take a test, and then be able to cross over, right? There comes a certain amount of baggage with that. And then he was like, hey, we should just open up accessions and let people come through. Joe did that, right? For certain zones, which is X number of years that you've been in the Air Force, Joe was able to get the highest number for your retention bonus, right? We're talking over six figures for certain career, Thanks. for certain year groups, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks from Big Herm, right? So that's all being driven by Joe, the CFM team, the A26, driving all of those changes, right? But he had identified these problems at the 33rd, at the A36, because he got to see it, and then he got to take that from tactical experience to strategy and figure out how to make it better writ large. Is it perfect? No. Have we solved all the things? No. But that is Joe Ippolito in a nutshell, right? So ultimately, what I get, want to take away is it's a story of people, Joe's one of the best individuals I've ever met um, and had the privilege of meeting. And let's retire him. Right? Thank you, Colonel Freeman. Thank you, Colonel Kim. Colonel Freeman and Chief Ippolito, would you please join Colonel Kim on stage for the medal presentation and retirement orders? Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the presentation of the Legion of Merit. Attention order. Chief Master Sergeant Joseph R. Ippolito distinguished himself by exceptional meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding service to the United States as Cyber Warfare Operations Air Force Career Field Manager from 9 February 2022 to 31 December 2024. During this period, Chief Ippolito provided strategic oversight to 2,100 total force cyber warfare operations airmen. He spearheaded multiple initiatives to resolve manning shortages, including reinstating and maximizing pay incentives, bolstering enlistment rates by 23%. Additionally, he solved a five-year technical training capacity shortfall by increasing fill rates from 45 to 96% and developed the first special experience identifier data strategy to effectively manage the talent of 51,000 airmen. 
Chief Ippolito's leadership and tireless efforts paved the way for enlistment bonuses for recruits. This initiative, this initiative proved successful and has significantly increased accessions, meaning the Secretary of the Air Force's intent to attract and retain technical skills and talent. Furthermore, he revolutionized cyber operations recruitment processes by gaining approval for direct accessions and champion technical school transformation by modernizing the curriculum, securing additional dorm space, and streamlining three courses into one. Finally, Chief Ippolito's leadership was instrumental in reinstituting Air Force warrant officers and the establishment of the Cyber Warfare Operations Specialty. The singularly distinctive accomplishments of Chief Ippolito culminate a distinguished career in the service of his country and reflect great credit upon himself and the United States Air Force. Freeman and Colonel Kim will now retire Chief Ippolito. Publish the order. Attention to order. Department of the Air Force, Washington, D.C. Special Order Number 013487 to Chief Master Sergeant Joseph R. Ippolito, Pentagon, Washington, D.C., effective 31 December 2024. You are relieved from active duty headquarters, United States Air Force, Pentagon, Washington, District of Columbia, and retired from the United States Air Force, effective 1 January 2025. After 25 years and two days of faithful and honorable duty, per Air Force Instruction 36 TAC 3203 and the grade of Chief Mass Sergeant by order of the Secretary of the Air Force. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Colonel Freeman and Colonel Kilm will now present the retirement certificate. It reads, Certificate of Retirement from the Armed Forces of the United States of America. To all who shall see these presents, greetings. This is to certify that Chief Master Sergeant Joseph R. Ippolito, having served faithfully and honorably, is retired from the United States Air Force on the first day of January, 2025. Signed, General David W. Alvin, Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force and Lieutenant General Leah Lauterbach, Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, Reconnaissance, and Cyber Effects Operations. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are married. Come on. Chief Master Sergeant Ippolito also received a certificate of appreciation from President Joseph R. Biden, Jr. It reads, I extend my personal gratitude to the sincere appreciation of a grateful nation to you for your patriotic service to our country. Your bravery and dedication in our armed forces helped protect your fellow Americans during a critical moment in our history and contributed to a world of greater security and growing prosperity. Your devotion to honor, duty, and country in keeping with the long traditions of the finest military in the world embodied the American ideal, ideal of selfless service. Our nation owes you an incredible debt. Your commitment and the example you set will inspire future generations to serve with pride and to keep our country secure. You represent the best of our nation, and I join our fellow Americans in saluting your honorable service. I wish you happiness and success in your next chapter. Signed, Joseph R. Biden, Jr., Commander-in-Chief. Additionally, Chief Master Sergeant Ippolito received a certificate of appreciation from the Chief Master Sergeant Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant David A. Flozy. It reads, I am proud to join your friends and family in, con <laughs> in congratulating you on your retirement from the United States Air Force. The achievements and contributions you have made throughout your career are indicative of the core values of our great service. Your retirement is well deserved, but your selfless contributions will be sorely missed. On behalf of all airmen, Thank you for your faithful and devoted service to our nation. As this chapter in your life closes, 
a new one begins. I hope the years are filled with more great memories and continued success. Thank you, presiding officers. You can your seats. Now it's time for the lapel pin presentation. I would like to invite Mrs. Ippolito to come forward for the Air Force retirement pin presentation and pres the presentation of the spouse's certificate. Mrs. Ippolito, would you present your spouse with the Air Force retirement pin? This pin is to be worn on the left lapel of your uniform next to your heart, where you can always wear it with pride. It signifies to everyone that the wearer of this pin has served this country well and honorably. Oh, oh stay on stage, stay on stage, ma'am, stay on stage. Now I would like to read the spouse certificate of appreciation from the United States Air Force. In grateful appreciation, the United States Air Force presents this certificate of recognition to Mrs. Alexis Ippolito for their commitment and numerous contributions that made positive impacts to the nation's defense. Thank you for the support, which gave strength and purpose to your spouse's service. Signed, General David W. Alvin, Chief of Staff, and Lieutenant General Leah G. Lauterbach, Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, Reconnaissance, and Cyber Effects Operations. Additionally, Mrs. Alexis Ippolito received a certificate of appreciation from the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant David A. Flossie. It reads, I join your spouse, family, and friends in thanking you for your numerous contributions and sacrifices you made in support of our United States Air Force. Your dedication gave strength and purpose to your sp spouse's service in defense of our nation. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> At this time, I would like to invite Leah, Thomas, and Alora Ippolito to come forward and join your parents as I read the Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you. It reads, throughout the years of your life, you have made sacrifices and you've served your country as much as I have done. In your loving way, you quietly shouldered the heavy burden that you were asked to carry. Most of the time, you could not understand why I was not there but you quietly hid, hid the tears, courageously put on a smile, and defiantly promised that you would support me. You were then, as now, one of the most important parts of my life, and it was your love that enabled you to assure me that what I was doing was important. I missed so many holidays and countless special occasions while you were left at home to worry while I was on difficult missions. You had to say goodbye to friends when we moved throughout the years, and you had to change schools. Your resilience and self-confidence throughout those frequent moves gave me strength. I am proud of you, for it was your love and support that sustained me in those difficult times. There's no way in my mind that I could have been a success in the military without having your support, your understanding, and most importantly, your unquestionable love. Thank you for being there for me. Always remembered, never forgotten. Thank you to all the Ippolito family for coming up. At this time, we will be honoring Chief Ippolito by conducting a flat folding ceremony. Today's ceremony is being led by Senior Master Sergeant Lowe and Senior Airman Jansen. The flag was flown over all duty, loca all duty locations where Chief Ippolito has served 
as well as all duty locations containing one Bravo Airman. For more than 200 years, the American flag has been the symbol of our nation's unity, as well as a source of pride and inspiration for mi millions of citizens. Born on June 14, 1777, the Second Continental Congress determined that the flag of the United States be 13 stripes, altering between seven red and six white, and that the Union be 13 stars, white in a blue field representing the new constellation. Between 1777 and 1960, the shape and design of the flag evolved into the flag presented before you today. The 13 horizontal stripes represent the original 13 colonies, while the stars represent the 50 states of the Union. The color of the flag are symbolic as well. Red symbolizes hardiness and valor. White signifies purity and innocence. And blue represents vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Traditionally, a symbol of liberty, the American flag has carried a vestige of freedom and inspired Americans both at home and abroad. In 1814, Francis Scott Key was so moved at seeing the stars and stripes waving after the British shelling of Baltimore's Fort McHenry that he wrote the words to the Star Spangled Banner. In 1892, the flag inspired Francis Bellamy to write the Pledge of Allegiance, our most famous flag salute and patriotic oath. In July 1969, the American flag was flown in space when Neil Armstrong planted it on the surface of the moon. Today, our flag flies on constellations of Air Force satellites that circle our globe and on the fin flash of our aircraft in harm's way in every corner of the world. Indeed, it flies in the heart of every airman who serves our great nation. The sun never sets on our U.S. Air Force nor on the flag we so proudly cherish. Since 1776, no generation of Americans has been spared the responsibility of defending freedom. Today's airmen remain committed to preserving the, that, the freedom that others want for us, for generations to come by displaying the flag and giving it a distinctive fold. We show respect to the flag and express our gratitude to those individuals who fought and continue to fight for freedom at home and abroad. Since the dawn of the 20th century, airmen have proudly flown the flag in every major conflict on land and skies around the world. It is their responsibility, our responsibility, to continue to protect and preserve the rights, privileges, 
and freedoms that we as Americans enjoy today. The United States flag represents who we are. It stands for the freedom we all share and the pride and patriotism we feel for our country. We cherish this legacy as a beacon of hope to one and all. Long may it wave. As a child, Joey joined the Civil Air Patrol, where he quickly promoted and earned a Billy Mitchell Award, which allowed him to join the Air Force directly as an Airman First Class, bypassing the Airman Basic and Airman Ranks. On the first day of basic training, then Airman Ippolito was found teaching his flight how to complete facing movements, much to the surprise of his military training instructors. In tech school, Airman Ippolito graduated satellite wideband and telemetry tech school, systems tech school, excuse me, with an impressive 99% grade average. His score was much, much higher than his competition, Airman Norman Thompson. He received orders to Shaw Air Force Base. Airman Ippolito's first assignment was Shaw Air Force Base, supporting the 682nd Air Support Operations Squadron whose mission was to provide close air support in support of the 18th Airborne Corps and 82nd Airborne Division. At this assignment, Airman Ippolito was, a, was busy perfecting his craft as a satellite communications technician, working on a 94 Alpha satellite communications terminal, track 170, digital troposcatter radio system, and the TSSR, or the tropospheric satellite support band, right, excuse me, support radio. It was here that his supervisor also taught him how to show up to work on time without earrings after a night of clubbing and to shave his face to include the sideburns and that pushing boundaries sometimes resulted in boundaries pushing back. It was these, these moments that helped shape Joey and the person he is today. Airman Ippolito also made a lifelong friend in Stephen Young who happened to buy Joey his first bass guitar. That was a big mistake. At Shaw Air Force, <laughs> at Shaw, C. Airman Ippolito had the opportunity to perform base honor guard duty, and while performing this duty, the tragic events of September 11 unfolded. Shortly after, Airman Ippolito arrived in Afghanistan that January and devised a solution with his friend C. Airman Charita Johnson to transfer communication support to the Army, resulting in their entire team returning home without the need for reconstitution. Also, while deployed, he received orders to Germany to the 1st Combat Communication Squadron. While in processing the 1st Combat Communication Squadron, Senior Airman Ippolito met a beautiful woman that he was completely smitten with. After reminding her that he could actually read and what can only be described as the most amazing first date in Air Force history, Airman Ippolito and Airman Alexis Schuller were nearly inseparable. Nearly because Joe also befriended two airmen named Tony Contonio thank you, and Derek Lugo, and they started a band the likes of which had never, never been seen. <laughs> and they called themselves the Resonance. They were just short one guitar player. And uh, Joey knew what he had to do, and he asked Steve to come join his band in Germany. He came, and they toured Germany. And by tour, I mean uh, they played two shows before breaking up due to military obligations. <laughs> Regardless, there was still work to do in the ground radio shop with legends like Ski, Starnes, Mercado, BGM, and Herring, who all taught Joe what it meant to work hard and play hard, but more importantly, how to be an NCO. J Joe deployed to Al Dafra Air Station in the United Arab Emirates. While there, Alexis secretly informed him he was being promoted to Staff Sergeant. Upon, return, upon returning, now Staff Sergeant, don't call me Joey anymore, I'm an NCO, call me Joe, Ippolito was placed in the quality assurance flight and discovered his love for developing training plans and his new role as a maintenance training manager which previously had never been performed by a staff sergeant in this unit. At the end of this assignment, Chief Ippolito made the best decision of his life 
and asked Alexis's father, Gare, for his daughter's hand in marriage. After he was informed that there were no returns or givebacks, Joe and Alexis happily married before transferring to their first duty assignment together as husband and wife. Joe and Alexis, who was now pregnant, completed a cross-country trip to their new duty location at Bill Air Force Base, California. They left from Jacksonville, Florida, with their two dogs and a U-Haul truck that had seats that didn't recline and only had one minor accident. Joe was assigned to an aircraft maintenance squadron supporting the Global Hawk mission. It was here that Joe and Alexis took on their most important role as parents when, Le when Leah was born. They also made lifelong friendships with Justin and Katie Gentile as it turned out, whenever Joe and Alexis had a child, Joe would just bypass all the hard stuff and just volunteer for a deployment. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, he probably got picked up for the employment. Uh, <laughs> oh man. Right. After, the, after the birth of Leah, Joe went back to Aldafra Air Station and United Arab Emirates to support the Global Hawk mission and became an export, uh, expert cornhole player. Nearly two years after Leia's birth, Thomas was born, and the Ippolito family received orders back to Germany. Tech Sergeant Ippolito and family arrived to the first communications maintenance squadron back in Germany. So luckily, um, the Air Force has a rule that prevents military members from deploying immediately within a certain window. This window is 42 days. Naturally, Joe figured out how to deploy on the 43rd day to Camp <laughs> Asilea Cutter. Upon arrival, it was confirmed that he was patient zero on the camp and was quarantined immediately. Unfortunately, Alexis and the children also had contracted swine flu, but support from Joe's work center was amazing. Special thanks to Uncle Rudy Mendez and Josh and Jacinta Perkins. While Joe was performing grueling work in London, the Azores, Turkey, Belgium, and the Netherlands, just to name a few of the places that he was gallivanting, um, Alexis was, was at home having the time of her life as a single mother, <laughs> raising their two children in Germany, alone and unafraid. <laughs> After Joe promoted to Master Sergeant, they both knew this hardship tour had the end. So they devised a plan, and Alora was born. <laughs> Joe immediately called orders to the 51st Communication Squadron Osan Air Base, Republic of Korea, and Alexis went to Florida. Up until this point, Master Sergeant Ippolito always promoted on his first or second attempt. Little did he know, he was entering a new phase in his career. He's dubbed EPR Purgatory. Master Sergeant Ippolito grinded at Wolfson initially leading the radio shop and later the plans and programs work center. It was here that he orchestrated the installation of a new digital airport surveillance radar and air traffic control facility with the help of his friend, Tech Sergeant, now Chief Abby Scott. He also was hand carried in a present during his mentor by Santa Claus to Orange Park, Florida to see his wife and three children during Christmas. He later arrived to his follow on at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, where he led the PACAF Cyber Fusion Center, or PCFC, which is a fancy way of saying MCCC. In this role, Master Sergeant Ippolito oversaw and coordinated all Air Force communications activities across the Pacific area of responsibility. An opportunity then presented itself to retrain via on-the-job training into the 1B Cyber Warfare Operations career field, which Joe jumped on. After retraining, he was assigned to the 56th Air Communications Operations Squadron Mission Defense Team. Here, he got his feet wet defending the Falcon, defending the Falconer weapon system before moving over into the 613th Air Operations Center's Strategy Division, where he was assigned to the Information Operations Cell as a cyber planner. Once the assignment cycle came out, Joe was presented with two choices, San Antonio or San Antonio. 
Needless to say, he got his he got his first choice, his number one choice, and found himself assigned to the 24th Air Force Staff in the A5 Strategy Division. Here he met his hardest leadership test to date and Tech Sergeant James Constance. <laughs> General Wegeman, the 24th Air Force commander, clearly saw that supervising Sergeant Constance was no easy feat and rewarded Joe's Herculean effort with his number one strat. And on Joe's fifth attempt, he, he earned a promotion to senior master sergeant and an assignment to the 33rd Network Warfare Squadron. As a 33rd Network Warfare Squadron's operations superintendent during initial qualification training, CM Master Sergeant Ippolito earned distinguished graduate honors on the Air Force Cyber Defense Weapon System. He oversaw 101 b airmen in the defense of the Air Force's infrastructure networks, classified and unclassified enclaves. His talents were then needed elsewhere as the 836 Cyberspace Operations Squadron senior enlisted leader. Here, he navigated the Sun Warriors through COVID operations. During his time, he contracted necrotizing fasciitis and nearly lost his leg, or possibly, possibly his life. Luckily, he had an amazing team with Lieutenant Colonel Frank Lyons, Mass Sergeant Carl Kistler, and Mass Sergeant Matt Zillish to fall back on to lead the squadron, and several others also helped his family, specifically Tony and Lindsey Hoxie, Paul Averett, and many more that he cannot think enough. Since EPR purgatory was over, he managed to convince his leg to stay on also, he was rewarded with making Chief Master Sergeant on his first look. Because he did such a bang up job at the 33rd NWS as a Senior Master Sergeant, Chief Ippolito was reassigned to the 33rd NWS as their Senior Enlisted Leader, where he ushered the unit out of COVID and back to normal operations. Additionally, Chief Ippolito laid the groundwork for the merger of the 33rd NWS and the 68th NWS into the 33rd Cyberspace Operations Squadron before being selected as the 1B Air Force Career Field Manager. As the Career Field Manager, Chief Ippolito pivoted the career field to accepting direct accessions, oversaw significant technical school transformation, restored, established, and increased several incentive bonuses to improve retention rates. Furthermore, Chief Ippolito matured the career field to self-governance by establishing a functional assignment manager at AFPC and instituting a 1B's vote on 1B matters policy. Chief Ippolito finishes his 25-year career as a career field manager. While the Air Force may be losing an incredible leader and chief, his impact on the Air Force and the airmen he has served is generational. His family, Alexis, Leia, Thomas, and Alora, are looking forward to the quality and fun times they would get to spend together now that their husband and dad is retired. Thank you, flight detail. At this time, we would like to invite the deputy 1B4 CFM Chief Master Sergeant Select Timothy Lowe to present Chief Hippolito with a retirement gift. All right, let's go. You did it! Congratulations. Um, Joe, uh, you know, he tends to say one of his 
the proudest moments of his career and, and, and some he's most proud of is leading the one Bravo Airmen. I've been uh, his teammate in a, uh, for a year now. Um, I'd probably say this is my biggest honor, getting to present this. I'm going to get emotional. I do it. It's fine. Um, <laughs> this is probably uh, the moment I'm most proud of, to, to present this to you on behalf of the Juan Bravo community for everything you've done, not only for the Air Force, but for our career field. Thank you so much. You left it in really good hands with Chief Gordon coming along. But I mean, you, you did your part. So thank you so much for everything. And congratulations to you and your family. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Chief of Select Low. At this time, we would like to invite Captain Anthony Partisini from the 333rd Training Squadron to come forward to present Chief Ippolito with a retirement gift. Hey, Chief. Hey, sir. So, on behalf of Lieutenant Colonel Meadows, Chief Isbell, and all of the Mad Ducks. Uh, speaking of the Mad Ducks, can I get all the Mad Ducks that are here, present, past, and just come on up here, everybody. Let's go. Including you. Yeah. 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 So Mad Ducks from like way back when also? Past, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Students? Or? I mean, they were PCS. Hey, this is my mini Mad Duck right here. Yeah. 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 All around, wherever you're at, go room. ahead. Yeah. We just want to thank you for everything that you've done to improve the one bravo training improve, improve all of us in one area and it's pretty different from the other stuff yeah it's working right here <laughs> so thank you thank you so much everybody get in oh. no 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 you ma'am would you a little bit closer don't mind <laughs> There we go, on three, one, two, three. One more, on three, one, two, party. All right. <laughs> We're doing that. <laughs> Thank you, Captain Partisini. Mrs. Ippolito, please come forward. Not near me. <laughs> it's okay, it's up to you. This is your day. Shadow boxes are born of an ancient military tradition that is still practiced today, both in the militaries of the world and throughout civilian life. This box is laden with items that represent the honorees' military service, accomplishments, and achievements. These items may include personal awards, medals, <laughs> duty station memorabilia, insignia badges, and uniform devices that indicate progression through various military ranks. The national flag is placed inside the shadow box to symbolize the country that has benefited from the faithful service of today's honoree. Chief Ippolito, on behalf of your fellow airmen, we present you with this shadow box. Within this box lies your most honored and cherished possessions representing a lifetime of valiant and faithful service. It's already presented, so got a little head of schedule, so. Do not worry if you didn't get a good look at it. The shadow box will be on display for your viewing after the ceremony. Chief Master Sergeant Retired Vanessa Johnston, please come forward for the end of trail presentation. Hello, everyone. Where am I? All right, there we are. Um, I'm Chief Master Sergeant Vanessa Johnston, retired, and on behalf of all the chiefs around the world, I want to take an opportunity to formally thank Chief Ippolito and recognize his unparalleled service to our country. Would all the active, retired, and future chiefs please come forward and make a line from the stage to my right left. For those of you uh, who haven't seen this presentation, I want to take a moment to explain what you're going to witness. We have a tradition to recognize our retiring chiefs in the ceremony and of trails. The end of trail sculpture was sculpted by James Earl Fraser to depict the transformation of a proud spiritual people into the next century. And since then, it has many meanings and been, many meanings, excuse me, have been assigned to this, this sculpture. To Air Force chiefs, it's a representation of the warrior horse and a journey that is now complete 
and finally returning home to be with your family. We as chiefs are much attuned with the unyielding, fam uh, unyielding sacrifice required of the military family. And Joe, please know that we honor you today and your family for all of the chiefs that raised you, all of those that you have mentored and that will be future chiefs. We are now going to pass the statue across all the chiefs, sharing our wisdom and teammanship as we partner, because we can't do this alone. It's definitely done as a team of chiefs. And don't forget to turn me upside down at the end. <laughs> Before this is presented to Chief Ippolito, we will remove the warrior spear and invert it, symbolizing the formal transition between his life as a warrior and what will now follow. It is called the end of trail, but in truth, it is the beginning of another story, a second chapter. Chief Ippolito, as you and your family prepare to take the steps down your new trail, please accept our thanks for your leadership, your guidance, mentorship, and friendship, and your steadfast service to our country. On behalf of all the chiefs around the world, Good luck and Godspeed. <laughs> it's good. Way to uh, milk that uh, shippy exam, sir. I see what you did there with the knee. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present to you for the very first time Chief Master Sergeant Joseph R. Ippolito, United States Air Force, retired. So this has been a really busy week for me, and I did not write us anything. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. I didn't, I, didn't write, I didn't write anything, but I'm pretty good at doing this at this point, so uh, um, you know, bear with me. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm so honored by everybody's presence, and I, I just wanna thank you all. I know several people have come from far and wide. Um, you know, what's, what's funny is uh, I have people almost from every base. Uh, I actually have my tech school roommate here, um, which is cool. I'm not going to call you out, Jeff. You don't have to stand up or anything. But uh, it's really n just neat. Um, but f first, first and foremost, I, I do want to, you know, can we give uh, a round of applause for Chief Garces? Allison, thank you so much. That was awesome. So Chief. Chief Garces and I, uh, she was at the 426 as their first sergeant for a little while, and uh, I asked her to come do this because she was somebody that uh, has been in my life, and I've loved watching you grow from a master sergeant to now a chief, and it's just super cool. Um, invocation, um, <laughs> uh, James, thank you for, for that. Um, <laughs> we're even, so, so I, d I do want to share. I, I want to share something real quick. Um, about, I don't know, four or five years ago, he was promoting, and he called me up to do the invocation without me knowing. Uh, I looked like a complete idiot in front of General Skinner, and it, 
apparently they all were in on it too, but um, it wasn't great. So, <laughs> so similar to Constance's invocation, um, it w also wasn't great, but it was good enough. You <laughs> did try, but thank, thank you, and we're even. All right. Um, yeah, ev everybody here, thanks. Um, obviously, Colonel Freeman, Colonel Kim, uh, thank you. I'm going to get back to you guys in a second. Brigadier General Select Hazor, thank you for being here. I'm so happy that you are. And yeah, this is, she's going to do great things, guys, as soon as we decide to put up a star on her. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I, I do want the, so through the ranks was uh, that presentation that you saw where uh, they were doing the flag, um, passing the flag, and that, and that symbolized every rank that I hold. I, I think you guys picked up on that. But what you probably don't know is when I became the CFM, I knew I wanted to do that, and I knew I wanted to do that with all one bravos, which is why I turned on direct sessions. So, <laughs> so that through the ranks, that through the ranks, I believe, is the first through the ranks with all one bravo airmen. Yeah. So. so thank you guys for thank you guys for doing that. Um, I ordered coins. You guys were gonna get one, but they'll be here on the fifth. So <laughs> we'll we'll get you taken care of uh, in that way. It, it's a super cool coin too. I'm so upset because they said it was gonna be here and it's not. But you know, you'll get it. It's uh, it's even better than my poker chip, I believe, which some of you guys have seen. Um, Xavier, thank you for narrating. What an amazing, like, silky smooth voice, right? <laughs> now, Xavier's been around me a long time. We've uh, bounced ideas off each other. He used to be a dentist, and now he's a cyber warrior. So he went from, you know, looking at your teeth to looking at your uh, PCAP. So <laughs> for those who don't know, those are log files of cyber stuff. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Hello, thank you for proffering. I appreciate it. Um, you know, the congrats on Chief. You're, we already talked about this. <sighs> so, uh, Jose, I don't know if you can hear me if you're in this room or not, but thank you. And then uh, I, I do want to take a really big um, pause to thank uh, Sergeant Demetrius Rogers. He actually put all of this together by and large. Um, I had to do some things, but it was only because he told me to. Um, but s serious, thank you. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like, I, I honestly can't thank you enough. Like, really. Like, you. I know how much you did. Like, so these retirement ceremonies. Um, I've done a few of them, and they're they're not too bad. They're they're they're. They're a lot of work. Um, every retirement ceremony is a lot of work. What I didn't realize was having a retirement ceremony in the Pentagon, like it's like putting that on hard mode. <laughs> and <laughs> dude, hats off to you, seriously. <laughs> All right. Um, so who, who's got the over and under on me crying? Well, I mean, I already cried a little bit, so um, it's really hard when I look at my wife. Um, so, so before I do that, I do want to take a moment. I'm so sorry to do this, but uh, Colonel Maxwell, you, I think we had this conversation. Can you stand up for a second? Oh All right. Dad, Dad, can you stand up for a second? You may or may not see it, but I think you guys look identical. <laughs> like, you guys need to talk because, like, I think you're just going to love each other. <laughs> <laughs> no, for, no, I'm not kidding. Like, do you guys see the resemblance? I mean, I like. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so, <the laughs> thanks. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, moving on. Um, Leah, Thomas, Alora, I love you guys. Thank you. I'm looking forward to finding out what it means to be your dad as not as an Air Force retiree. Um, I think we're going to have some good times. I love you too. Um, <laughs> where's the water? 
Oh, oh man, somebody stole the water. Dang. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um. <laughs> so, uh. <laughs> Yeah, you are. <laughs> Alexis, um, you know, I love you so much, and we've been doing this a long time, and eh, I'd say I'd say the right amount, but uh, but thank thank you. Uh, like some folks have said, I, I did almost separate uh, on two occasions, I think, and Alexis, you know, realized the value of a pension. <laughs> So, so thank you for, uh, you know, convincing me to stay in. And then, uh, you know, I, I know because there's a lot of people from my first and second bases, um, and I've talked to some of you guys already, but like, and you've heard, but my, my career obviously uh, was not like some, like some people's careers, it seems like, uh, and, and rightfully so, because they don't mess up like I did. Um, but their careers are kind of on this glide pl path that just takes them to greatness. And and it's amazing to watch, but that was not my path. Um, my path had a lot of ups and downs. Uh, Alexis will tell you, um, I haven't changed a whole lot. And I know you guys, some of you guys know me quite a bit, but my mouth didn't necessarily match my rank. Um, <laughs> but now it does, I guess, so <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> well, I was like a tech sergeant when you, I was getting there. I actually, I made master when you showed up, so you were a good, good luck charm. Um, yeah, so first base was Shaw, had a lot of great people. All of the names that you, you heard, um, it was really important for me to call them out because they've been, they've been amazing. Um, I do want to pause, rewind a little bit. Uh, Bonnie and Gare. I love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting us over the years. Mom, thank you for supporting us over the years. Dad, same thing. Um, it's awesome to have my whole family uh, together in one, one area. It's not often that I, that happens. I think the last time was my wedding, 18 years ago almost. So it's really cool. Um, nobody's killed each other yet, so that's a blessing. Um, what else? Yeah, so you know, I had a successful band. We <laughs> toured Germany. I, I, I just loved it. That's why we didn't make any money. I just did it for the love of the of the music, and the art. Um, <laughs> I told you guys I did not write anything. Um, yeah. Uh, so I know that for a lot of the military members in here, it's very rare. I might even say I've never seen two officiants for uh, any ceremony, let alone a retirement. But um, because of the way my career was, uh, it was very up and down. And um, for those who don't know, and, and I know a lot of you do, because I, I'm, I'm, I really don't hold back, but when I was in tech school, I got an Article 15. I had a lot of issues. Um, I had a hard time making it to work, showing up to work. Uh, I always was a hard worker, like, and smart, just not smart enough to not drink too much or, or whatever it was that I was doing that was causing me all the troubles I was having. But uh, because of that, like, initial instance, for a long time it seemed like people were always, uh, like, instead of helping raise me up, they were more, like, waiting for me to mess up again. And I kind of, it's like, you know, when you're told something, you kind of become that thing. And I think that was kind of the issues that I had, right, was like, um, you know, it was, it was just hard to excel because I was in that situation. And, and it was, you know, a lot of it was self, self done on my own part. And then I had, a, I had, and I've had great supervisors through those years, but I had, I had a great commander in Colonel Freeman and, um, I just felt like you believed in me. Um, <laughs> when I when I needed it, and uh, 
you know, we've stayed in contact ever since, and you you do mean a lot to me, and I know you know that. But uh, I, I do, besides, you know, Alexis, I, I attribute you as one of my commanders, uh, as a the commander that kind of turned me around a little bit. Um, I felt like I always had a lot of potential, but it was very hard to realize that until I had somebody that, you know, was willing to believe in me and try to foster that and plant that and grow that so thank you and thank you for being here <sighs> so i lost on the crying thing right like <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so and then with colonel kim um I feel like when I finally got to you, Colonel Kim, and I know we had that amazing first interaction where I was like, I don't want to come here. <laughs> like, did it once. I got, yeah, got the t-shirt. But it was cool getting the second t-shirt. Um, there's just something about, you know,